Okay, welcome everybody. Today we are uh, moving on to PMBOK. Previous three lectures were spent in uh, the introductory things about the project management and the professional certification and all that. Today we are going to the introduction of the PMBOK. That is the very first chapter. So this is the very first chapter and in introduction we will be covering the project management framework the standard of project management which is the third chapter you uh, now in appendix we'll cover that and then the third section would be the 10 knowledge areas so first two chapters is the introduction and uh, uh, little advanced concept third chapter is section 2 which is the standard of project management and third uh, third section would be the 10 knowledge areas and uh, in between we'll also talk about some of the professional responsibilities which are required to be known for the project manager <laughs> right. So we will go exactly according to PMBOK and this first chapter of PMBOK is outlined as in front of you. First of all, we will be discussing the purpose of this guide. Then we will define the Hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, I'm just getting access to the uh, to the screen just now sir okay okay yes okay so uh, this is the content which we are discussing uh, today first we'll debate the purpose of the PMB okay why it was created and what uh, is the purpose of it then some basic questions what is a project and what is project management although you might know the solution to that answer to that but the thing is uh, you probably do not know as explained in this standard and that is exactly what uh, is to be understood and followed in the future. Then a more intricate topic that is the relationship amongst the portfolio management, program management, project management and the overall big concept of organizational project management. And then the next topic 1.5 will be the relationship between the project management operations management and the organizational strategy. Then, as I said earlier, there, were, there is a new uh, emphasis on business value. So, 1.6 talks about business value, which is new to standard uh, edition 5. Previously, this topic was never there. So, this is beyond strategy. PMBOK is now accessing those areas, which is beyond strategy. How it can bring value to the organization. Then, there are some, uh, uh, some talk on the role of the project manager and ultimately project management body of knowledge is explained a bit right starting with the purpose what is the purpose you see PMI is a global volunteer body to establish standard for project management it was established in 1969 and uh, that was done by some uh, like-minded four or five people sitting like friends in a drawing room of a of one of the persons and they said every professional body has uh, some you know standards or guidelines provided to them but project management is one area which is practiced by everybody but it is not agreed by everybody everybody has his own con connotation on project management civil engineers do a different kind of project management IT people have different connotation of project management so what the project a project manager as a management as a discipline should have or what all should be included in project management there should be a general guideline or a standard provided for the project manager this was a very challenging job or rather uh, you can say it was almost an impossible kind of job to get a consensus from project managers from all over the world from different industries from different cultures how can you standardize something which is so widely spread out and believed to be true everywhere. Everyone has his own version of protein. So 
uh, this was a difficult job they launched themselves into. So the main purpose was to identify that subset of project management body of knowledge that is generally recognized as good practice. Now this sentence is very, very, very rich. It says it is only an identification. This is not an explanation. This is not an exhaustive description. We just need to say, well, if you want to do project management, you must be doing this, 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 and this. So general identification of all the ingredients which have to be included for all kinds of project management. That is important. It is not only for a civil engineer. It is not only for... These are those generalities, those generally recognized practices which uh, every project manager worldwide should agree or would agree. So anything which, uh, uh, you know, any practice which was in construction project management agreed by all construction engineers but could not have been applied to IT or any other area, those have not been uh, recognized or identified into the generic project management practices. Um, then the question was of general recognition. How can we get a wholesome consensus from all wide world, all the project managers, how can they agree on certain practices? So it's a general recognition. Um, although the room for dif uh, differing from this still remains open and still today there are many people who very strongly oppose PMI, oppose this standard, but there are very few people. So that much flexibility had to be there. There, there are, uh, I personally know some, many, some of the people who um, do not like PMI, who do not like the, the standard. Although PMI has got some of its own idiosyncrasies, but at the same time, this is the best thing ever happened to project management. There is no other standard. So this uh, at least provides us a path to walk on. So what we say is, whatever is the latest edition of PMBOK, no matter how uh, there might be some mistakes in it, there might be some improvements required in it. But for the time being, uh, this is the rope I'm holding on to. As soon as they change it, I'll follow the change version and let us be the part of the change. Let us participate in the evolution of this standard. I have seen the evolution of PMBOK right from the first edition and every time it was a satisfaction. It was something will evolve out of it. Something good will happen. Still, you know, uh, I, I was talking to another person who is an Egyptian um, and uh, he is very much, you know, always talking about PMB, okay, does not cover this, this is not good, this is not that. And at the same time, he's a trainer of PMI, right? He trains his people. So, uh, although he has very good concept, but naturally, I have my own you know, views and I differ with him a lot because uh, uh, I, I wrote a, uh, a paper a few, some uh, few days ago. It was on um, uh, a role of human resource in, you know, monitoring and control of the project. And he said that, uh, um, he wrote me and uh, wrote me a message and said, uh, well, this is wrong and PMI should have thought about it before and this and that. And now they are going to change this. I said, well, if it is changed, you will accept it as a change. But for now, what is whatever is given as a generally recognized good practice, we must all agree to that. And let's agree to disagree. And maybe, you know, uh, that could be uh, one of my initiatives to contribute towards PMI in the next edition and tell them well this thing could be improved in this way and that's how the things go on and exactly uh, I have been part of uh, uh, PMBOK as I told you earlier also and uh, 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 in the uh, formation of probably that was third edition I was in the core team of uh, this, this standard and otherwise also I've been contributing even in the sixth edition which is coming up uh, the, there is a contribution from my side there as well. But you see, uh, we have to uh, generally agree, everybody can't agree, but we have to generally agree uh, about these practices. Okay, that means we are filtering only those commonalities from worldwide practices of project management, the commonalities we are taking out and filtering them into generally recognized. That is okay. Uh, that means if there is some specific 
uh, item uh, of project management only done by construction industry that would not come into the general recognition so that is out of it so they can have their own business as far as that is concerned but when we talk about general project management uh, generic project management then uh, th those uh, common practices would get together but the question is uh, what if though some of those common practices are not good they are bad should we follow the bad practices just because everybody else is following it so that was the third point in the purpose that we will only follow the good practices we will eradicate the bad practices and we will only choose out the good practices from this general recognition so ultimately whatever is included in project management body of knowledge these are only the good practices Jahan, you are following me Sir. Okay. So we are only talking about the good practices. Now, uh, why don't we talk about the best practices? Everywhere else, when we, you know, wherever we go, we just talk about best practices. This is, a, this is kind of a lingo nowadays. What are the best practices? And these are the best practices. And we are doing the best practices. What are the best practices? And why do uh, we? Uh, I'm I'm saying the word good practice. And why PMBOK says good practice? What is the difference between good practice and the best practice? Anything? Uh, uh, what, what I'm saying, I think, sir, uh, good practices, best practices might be best practices for one person or uh, one set of company. Okay. But that might not be best practices for the others. So, generally accepted good practices something which which we can agree. Like uh, other comp other uh, you know uh, uh, people who do disagree with us can can generally agree to it. So so that will be a good practice, not a best practice. Okay, I will I'll partially agree with you. Uh, what do you say, Dilshan? I don't want uh, at the moment. I don't want to differentiate between good or bad. Mm -hmm. Good or uh, best practices. Uh, I have a question in my mind while you are explaining this. Mm -hmm. uh, in accounting world also, mm -hmm. there are globally accepted accounting principles. Yes. Or uh, generally accepted accounting principles to be specific. And there is a lot that you can change while doing accounting. Right. In various areas. In construction, the accounting principles are specific. A little bit specific in maybe the electronics industry, those principles at times are different, the overheads are different, mm. some bits also do. So, but there are accepted principles which are generally accepted all across, all across the board. Board base. And that has been there in this accounting world for mm. quite a while now. Right. Now, my question is as you have been associated with this. Uh, the yeah, environment right. area since about the start of it, in the 80s probably. Uh, over these about like 30 years or so, 30 or 40 years or so, whatever time has passed, mm -hmm. uh, these principles which are generally accepted mm -hmm. principles for project management. Right. How many how much how how much percentage of the principles do you think are general for all the industries? I mean, like, uh, have you found really that there are so many, so many commonalities in project management in various industries, and have these commonalities grown in the exactly. subset over the over the expansion of the industries mm -hmm. that we have seen in the IT and in the various other uh, biggest development fields? Mm -hmm. Have you seen this grow? This subset of course, growing size? Of course. You see, the problem with project management is. Everybody is a project manager. An accountant is a project manager. A construction engineer is a project manager. A lawyer is a project manager. Everybody can be a project manager. So this is not just a matter of, this is not a profession by itself. Project management is not a profession by itself. But with a standard, we are trying to standardize that wherever the project has to be run, no matter what industry it is, these principles must be followed. Because this, these things did not exist as a standard before. Yes, there were books, there were authors who have their own way of thinking and they, they, they had been writing some books and 
there were some very good books also but they lacked a lot many things again it was point of view of a single person and he was he was having my big view he was looking at the thing maybe from the construction industry perspective or some other perspective so the older books of project management were not good enough and there uh, there was a disparity you read one thing in one book and another thing in another book and there was a lot of confusion about operations and projects in it what to talk about project program and portfolio that was a totally confused confused concept even projects and operations were interchangeably used sometimes you started calling an operation as a project and sometimes operation became project and something you don't know where where is the boundary of project and where is the boundary of operation that is one thing so if you talk about a specific industry like finance or construction or it or whatever so they can have their own principles you know over the years and they are they have groomed into something and now they are being followed project management is a, a young area from the standardization point of view in 69 they started this concept in uh, 80 81 they came up with the first time the framework came out as a 12 page document in 96 first time it came up with uh, in form of a uh, book and standard and yes and still after every years they are revising it always improving so it is going through a progressive elaboration it is being continuously improved having said that uh, so specifics are aside and i have also highlighted that uh, this is a difficult area this could not be you know uh, you can't live in a shell and create a environment or a principles around it this is something you have to interfere with everybody's business a lawyer's business a doctor's business an engineer's business everybody's business you are you are inter- interfering and you have to somehow convince the whole wide world that this is how this should be thing should be done Are they convinced? Are the of course, of course. Exactly. The exactly. You see, there were organizations, uh, multi multinational organizations, who were so much interested in project management that they created their own standards in their organizations. IBM, Oracle, Nokia, Siemens, uh, Nokia and Siemens, and so every big organization had their own mechanism of project management. They had their own certification. still ibm has their own certification but as soon as this pmbo ke thing came out everybody started clustering around pmi and they started learning i remember in 2005 i think me 2003 probably 2003 i went to a pmi global congress in uh, chico slovakia and uh, naturally there is always a huge crowd huge crowd there the ceo uh, of the pmi he asked the whole crowd how many from ibm and you know what more than 60% people raised their hands they were from ibm and thousands of crowd in crowd of thousands of people if ibm has their own certification they have their own certificate, they should bother list but because they are impressed with it and they are trying to convert you know Uh, they are trying to abide by the standard they are trying to you know hold the hand of this uh, big body so they have joined hands and it is not only ibm you can see all the industries whether they have their own standards or not they all now agree with pmbo um, somebody was telling me a few days back that ibm still holds their certification previously um, i was i thought that they had finished off with their own certification but one thing i'm sure of that in their own internal standards they have included pmbo on the other hand there are quality standards quality standards also address project management to some extent um, in iso and cmmi they have recognized pmbo k as a proper standard and they have taken selected extracts of pmbo k into those standards prince to uk de facto standard for project management uh, there was a lot of confusion about you know term terminology and all that uh, back in 2001 once i did my certification in prince 2 and pmp i did in the same year 
uh, and I had a lot of difficulty because the terminology was different, concepts were different and all that. Recently, I was studying their, uh, their book and I found that they have converted all the terminology to the PMA terminology. Now they are all talking the same language. The concepts may be slightly different, the documents may be slightly different, but terminology is all same. So they are on the same platform. You mean that PMI and the PMDOK is the leader of the standards? Is the leader of the standards? Yes, of course. Of course it is. The industry is the leader. The whole wide world. whole wide world. And not only that, um, the organizations widely have accepted it, widely, all over the world. Moreover, the authors, this is the biggest change. Previously, there used to be a number of authors writing different things. Now, any book published after, say, 2000, any project management book, it, it definitely has to mention PMBOK. No matter if, even if he is differing with the idea of, PMB, uh, of the standard, but they all mention PMBOK, they all refer to PMBOK. They differ while they think of it. So, this has become a de facto standard. Moreover, ISO had recognized it in 2000 and uh, I think uh, 2001 or so, they had recognized it, uh, 1998, they had recognized it as an ISO standard. I mean, no, ANSI standard, ANSI, American National Standard Institute has, a, has recognized PMI, uh, PMBO as an ANSI standard. So, ANSI, American National uh, ANSI. ANSI. And the ANSI standard. Ah, yes, it is the ANSI standard. So this is fully recognized. ISO is especially international standard of um, ISO, no, it's not exactly I, uh, international standard organization. Uh, basically, uh, his name is slightly different in some, uh, there's a matter of uh, some other language or something. But the universe, uh, 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 this job is done, the ISO and CMMI, this job is then uh, done, uh, as was started on behest of Ministry of Defense, USA. They funded it. They funded a university. I, I don't remember the name of the university, University of Michigan, I have name, which one, but they funded the university and this was a volunteer effort. I really like the way their defense uh, in this, uh, defense uh, uh, ministry uh, you know, helps do these initiatives. They do not interfere. They encourage and facilitate. I was working on OPM3 standard with PMI and uh, we were in Switzerland and um, we were finalizing the standard and we were told that uh, uh, tonight we will have some guests coming from USA and uh, we will discuss the final version of the standard with them. And who were the guests? Probably I told you, they, are, they were from uh, US Air Force, uh, they were pilots in the rank of majors and you know things like that and you know four or five people came in ladies and gents and we had dinner with them and we discussed with them and you know they gave their inputs whatever they wanted to so uh, uh, Americans are keeping full track of everything but they don't interfere they don't enforce their viewpoint they let the volunteer ISO go on. ISO, uh, ISO yeah. is supported or authorized by NSI yes of course of course but I, ISO also originated from Ministry of Defense. Okay, and this thing originated? This independently originated, but it has a support of Ministry of Defense. Later on, Ministry of Defense requested PMI to, um, to give them a defense standard in alignment with PMBOK. Okay. So, as I was showing you the extensions, the government extension, the construction extension, the software extension, so these are the additions to PMBOK okay, for that specific discipline. So they have created a defense extension for US Army, US Defense Forces, a defense extension. And it used to be uh, open document earlier, but now it is, it is no more available. I have a copy of the old one, the, the original one. Um, and uh, I think, you know, I have a problem here in Pakistan. People do not want to learn and listen. I have been telling uh, it to Pakistan Army and all that. Well, you know, those guys have done this job. If you don't want to invent everything, why don't you follow it? And if you uh, tailor it according to your needs and requirements, it is not some computer bug that they will be, you know, you will be attached to the America with that. 
but if they are progressing or doing, doing a good job, you take benefit out of it. And we are so nonsense kind of people. We uh, this exactly the same thing happened with the C3 system, which probably uh, you know about. Um, I had the complete plan of uh, latest plan of C3I or and C4I from US archives, uh -huh. and I was serving in C3I. I told my bosses and generals and everybody that this is it. But uh, we just need to tailor it a bit, and we can uh, make a fantastic system around it. They said, no, we are working with Chinese. And what Chinese were doing, Chinese copied the same material, marked it with their name and sold it on a very heavy price to Pakistan army. And because that is a friendly country and we can't do nothing about it, so therefore, no. We have paid for that. We are paying through our nose. With the, whatever is happening now, this is also a continuation of that. You know, we were uh, practically given a shot of call that you uh, don't speak anymore. The job will be done by the Chinese, and I know how to do the job. They worked, worked under me um, on that project, and uh, out of the 12 people given to me, only two two were good. Rest I I had thrown away all the time. Rest of the 10 people I sent back to China. They knew nothing. They were just you know there for fun, eating, drinking, and enjoying, and that's it. So they were just burden on us. So. <laughs> So the American defense industry or defense uh, you know, procurement, procurement agencies mm -hmm. have recognized PMI mm -hmm. for procurement of their systems and their, uh, their programs. They have tailored it according to their needs. And that is what the purpose of the standard is. Defense you should extension. No, defense okay. extension and even defense extension is prepared by naturally uh, Ministry of Defense and PMI. Uh, but at the same time, standard is a standard you're not bound to want to follow it whatever it is you can tailor it to your requirements and make it your own rule a procedure so they have adopted their own procedure and they are working on it in America um, I have practically seen several organizations uh, truly following PMBO are trying to follow PMBO here we are not nobody is following PMBO at all here is just ISO, that means. For the ISO. No, you see, ISO is also a standard. So Standards are never mandatory. They are not uh, mandatorily to be followed. This is your will in which whether you want to use it or not. Well, why um, why do people use ISO in Pakistan? Is because when they have to interact with international business, they cannot, uh, you know, represent themselves if they are not ISO certified. And therefore, government of Pakistan has made it mandatory for such businesses to be ISO qualified. So the, this is a regulation. This is this is not that ISO is mandatory. ISO is optional, but government has made it mandatory for doing business. So that is a regulation. That is a regulation. Regulation is from the government side. For, for, for PMI, for project management, mm -hmm. this standard is not a mandatory certification for a company, for an organization to be you know, bidding for international contracts. No, 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 not not necessarily. Not as yet. Americans are quite wise on that. They don't, uh, you know, stick to any one thing. But uh, you know, our uh, good friends, um, Arabs, <laughs> they are so stupid. Whatever they heard about, they adopted. You know, I have never heard that Prince to our PMP is mandatory for any job. They say uh, always, you know, uh, worldwide, any ad you see, they say will be preferred. PMP required or preferred or whatever. They in in UAE and in Saudi Arabia, I have seen that they have made it mandatory not only for the project management job, for any job you you have to be either a PMP or a Prince. Too. Why? Because their lords are either Americans or British. So to make them happy, they will go down, troop down, troop down to any level. So people from here. I have sent people to Jada Municipality, about 12 engineers, I trained here, I sent them to Jada Municipality and uh, when they came back, uh, they say we did not use a single word of PMBOK. Okay? Nobody is ready to listen to it there. It is just a habit that you have to be a PMP. They don't use PMP at all. They don't know how to use it. And the interesting part is uh, now that we are discussing, they hire Britishers and Americans who are the most useless people in their country. 
and they are made the directors and whatever, whatever and they are paid you know 100 times more than a Pakistani you could have even better qualification even better everything experience and thing you will be paid only till a certain amount which is allowed to be paid to a Pakistani that is law of UK government they have distributed they have assigned a value to every nationality so as a Pakistani I was told um, I was offered a job which was being vacated by uh, by American and uh, um, that was a portfolio manager of Makkah municipality. So this Jada municipality people were going there, the contractors were going there and they, the, their foreigners were not allowed in Makkah. So they said, okay, so you are selected and this and that. And then, okay, what will be the salary and all? They said, oh, that could not be more than 30,000. Uh, I did talk to the other uh, previous portfolio manager and I said, you were paying him 150,000. 150,000 per month. <laughs> what is this nonsense? Why are you telling me that? You are replacing me with him. Is it, is it a for Pakistan? A for Pakistan. Yes. And then, you know, uh, when they had a problem, they agreed up to 50,000. I refused. Yes, Shaham? Yes, sir. It's the same here. Uh, all of the work is done by us, Indian and Pakistanis, but still they get the two times higher salary than us. Yeah. One of my, my friends, sir, he is a GIK graduate, Haseeb mm -hmm. Khan. Mm -hmm. Haseeb Khan. Mm -hmm. uh, so he was telling me we should go through a surgery to get our skin white. So we will also get the same because we already know how to do the work. So exactly. the only thing is the skin is not the white. Actually, so, yes, it is right, sir. The same is here. We consider our friends are not our friends. You think the Muslims are our friends, or the Arabs are our friends, or none of the Muslims are your friends. None Correct, of the Chinese sir. are your friends. My personal experience has been here, sir. Almost four years in here in UAE and in these Arab world, hmm. these Gulf countries, six or seven years. So they 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 only are business uh, oriented, sir. Anything, uh, even even here, sir. Hmm. The most of the expatriates are from India. Mm. And uh, we we Pakistanis have a bit of ego, so they they don't like us. Mm. Uh, we will be not submissive, so they will be like yeah. uh, whatever they told. Even if he gives a thappad bhi mare, tabhi bhi ha ha karega. So, isliye correct. Whatever you said, hundred percent, sir. Indians are more submissive, and you know they are very popular <laughs> with Arabs. They are very popular. They are very, mm, very successful there. Uh, one thing I, I just wanted to discuss, sir, and mm. share, uh, you know, my experience. Mm. All the, we call the bakas, the small shops, mm. they make a, a good money. Like uh, uh, the profit will be for the person minimum 6,000 to 7,000 dirhams. Like uh, one, ek lakh asi azar Pakistani banega. Chota bakala, a very, very small one even. Mm. Uh, none, of one, none of them you will you will find Pakistanis. Mm. Reason being, sir, uh, mm. the Arab guy or the locals will come nearby in their big cars and give the hunt mm. and the person inside will be running to go to the window he will be you know tinted glass goes down and he will give five dirhams or something to get something and then he will go inside and bring it back the Pakistani whatever he will haunt it or whatever he does even he is screaming but Pakistani will not come out so he has to get out from the his car and go inside the shop and get it so most of the uh, the businesses are uh, is run by Indians due to mm. all this. Maybe this is professionalism or whatever we say. We mm. are we are left behind mm. everywhere here. Of course, of course, yes. So there are some of our faults, some of the you know attitudes from our, all around the world, but we are left Correct. in many ways. Right. Anyway, yes. so uh, we were talking about the good and best practices. See. Um, a standard will never give you best practices, which is a normal misconception. People think that I know the standard, now I know the best practice. Now, you know, I'll go on the heights of the business. No, that's not the case. Good practice is only that much good, which is okay to keep you afloat. If you are bad, you are drowning. It is just your nose is out there and you are surviving 
this is good practice. So PMBOK, whatever practices are there, they are just good practices. If you follow them, you can remain afloat. And these are good practices are these are these are not mandatory because they are generally recognized and there are a lot many differences also. So you can suit your project. You can see these are these are the 47 courses. These are the various things which I have to do in project management. But uh, this thing doesn't apply to me. You can change it. You can tailor it. You can apply it as uh, as best you can. But these are just the good practices. Best practice is something beyond that. This is best practice comes into play when you are competing with someone. When you are competing with your you know equivalents or competitors or other businesses, then you have to be better than someone else and be the best. So you uh, do a kind of uh, a benchmarking of yourself against your competitors. Uh, reason being that all of them must be following some standard or good practice. Because if you are already following bad practices, you do not follow good practices, how can you suddenly become the best out of everyone? You can't uh, adopt the best practices of IBM. You are so bad that you are you know, doing bribery and every bad thing is there. And you say, IBM says uh, uh, you must do this. So this is the best practice. So we will do, adopt this best practice. So you can't adopt any best practice and they will, that is not going to benefit you at all. IBM has gone to that level after having uh, passed through many stages. It is just not that you take five top lessons from IBM and you start becoming IBM. You can't become IBM by that. You have to first uh, remove all the bad practices from your system, adopt all the good practices and then mature on that. And when you are ready for competition, then you can compare yourself with someone who is better than you or the, 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 the company which is the best. So in this benchmarking, you will find your competitor to compete with. Say you say I cannot compete with IBM because that is too high in the scale. I will compete with, with the immediate next competition. He is th this much points ahead of me and these are my weaknesses and these are his success rates. Uh, the points of success so I will improve on that track and then I will beat that and then I'll move on so this is how we follow the best practices best practices is a journey towards maturity of an organization so CMMI uh, for that matter from quality point of view or capability point of view CMMI is a maturity model ISO is a standard ISO talks about the good practices only uh, CMMI talks about best practices. Similarly, <coughs> these standards, the uh, capability maturity model, the, basically it was made for IT and it was called CMM. Later on when they adopt, started adopting in all over the industries, all the other industries also, they call, started calling it CMMI, capability maturity model integrated. So now uh, it is CMMI and any organization who is a CMMI, uh, they, uh, you are assessed for your maturity and they give you a scale, a level that you are level one organization, level two organization, level three organization. So uh, whatever level of CMMI, uh, CMMI you get, you have to upkeep that and there are few organizations in Pakistan who have CMMI level. ISO, almost everyone can have and many organizations have ISO certification, but ISO certification is only valid for a year or so, I think. Every year, they have to Every year you have to re be reassessed. Yeah, exactly. And you have to show improvement. If you don't, then uh, even you are not fo following the good practices. You are not even following the good practices. So you will go down, uh, you will again start down. Uh, uh, NADRA has got and, and NCR has got and uh, there are a lot many, I think more than 10 organizations have got so different levels. No, no, no. That is, uh, the area is different. There is a quality area. Quality and capability area. PMI uh, have their own maturity model. They have got organizational project management maturity model. They call it OPM3. OPM3. And uh, that has been in existence for probably more than 10 years now. This OPM is focused around uh, project management and CMMI. Project program and portfolio. A maturity of a project uh, of organizational project management is measured across projects programs and portfolios. 
So we have got three standards, project management, a guide to management, body of knowledge. We have got a standard for program management, we got a standard for portfolio management. A good organization was, must follow all three standards. Must follow the good practices of all three standards. And then mature. They will be assessed on each, each area. And their score will be representing how well this organization has performed overall in all three areas in competition with others. So what level it gets. So it's an assessment carried out by, uh, you know, certified professional, certified assessors and consultants of OPM3. And uh, they then advise you how, how to improve yourself. And how, uh, is CMMI is focused around this? this is, a is a capability, how to improve your capability, process improvement, quality. So CMMI is specific to that purpose. And you see, this, this is not the only maturity model. My PhD research was on this uh, uh, maturity models, and uh, trust me, there are more than 40 maturity models of project management alone. Project management alone, there are more than 40 maturity models. Naturally, the most famous and the best model is OPM3, but there are many people who have come up with many maturity models. Then. Uh, there are other areas, human resource maturity model, the risk maturity model, supply chain maturity model. Every no, every knowledge you can conceive, there is a maturity model created for that. So there are so many maturity models, but the most famous in uh, worldwide is CMMI, because CMMI integrated, CMM integrated is kind of uh, covers uh, almost all areas. It also looks after some parts of the project management, some parts of this, some parts of that. So, because it involves processes and processes like project management could be of anything, therefore that is more famous and more known to the world. But if you specifically want to, you know, develop in a specific area like supply chain, you want to be best in the supply chain and you have to follow supply chain maturity model. So, you, if you want to be a risk organization and the, the risk management maturity model. So, there are so many maturity models, you can search it on the internet and you will find an unending list of maturity models out there. So uh, this is the development of the knowledge that will happen. So my, uh, uh, having said that, my point is that a standard is never about best practices. It is always about good practices. So uh, an organization which uh, are a person, normally uh, the standards uh, are followed by the organization. Organization has to eradicate their bad practices and to do that they have to follow some standard if they follow the standard and they adopt it then uh, it is highly likely that they will be successful they highly likely their projects will be successful why i'm saying highly likely because there is no guarantee because this is a generic standard you know, one thing may work for you and may, may not work for me because your uncertainties are different my uncertainties are different so we have different perspective, different cultures, different countries. So generally recognized as good practice and generally, you know, uh, in most of the cases, it it will uh, benefit us. Yeah. So good practice means that there is a general agreement that the current application of these skills, tools, techniques can enhance the chances of success over a wide range of different projects. Good practice does not mean that the knowledge described should always be applied uniformly on all the projects. Don't make it a Bible. Exactly, I have to follow 100% according to BMBO. You know, you can diversify. But diversify with intelligence. Not being stubborn and saying, no, I will not follow BMBO. Well, why do you not follow BMBO? If you have a good reason, that is okay with me. But without having a good reason, just for the sake of... Uh, negating what is written in PMB, okay, if you are uh, opposing it, then there is no fun in it. You know, you must have a valid reason why we are not doing that. Maybe, you know, you, in your project, there is no role of procurement. You say, I will not adopt any procurement practices, that is fine with me. You don't follow that. None of the processes given in PMB, okay, are mandatory. But it generally says that it, it enhances your chances of success. If you follow these practices, generally they enhance your chances of success. So why why not? So better uh, and uh, naturally if you have a standard uh, established in your organization that we are following this standard, then basically you will develop your own project management methodology 
remaining under that standard. What is Prince 2? Prince 2, though they claim themselves to be a standard themselves in, a, in UK, but practically speaking, they are more detailed. They are basically a framework or a methodology. This is just like a, a government procedure of doing the projects. Like we have got PC1, PC2, PC3, PC4, PC5. So a government procedure, a government way of doing the thing. The UK have got a much refined mechanism, a very good mechanism through this Prince2 and other standards they have created around it. Uh, so uh, I don't say they are any bad. They are very good standards. Um, and we are still following the old you know, method of whatever uh, pre-partition ways and rules and uh, laws we are following all the same but they have changed their ways completely so that goes into the description of exactly what is to be done what document is to be created what, uh, how the document should look like what should be the format of it if there is a team to be established who will be the member of the team it's just like that so uh, this is not a standard essentially because essential uh, standards never uh, out, outline these kind of details they just identify this 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 you must do how you do it in what format you do it how many people sit together this is all the methodology which is to be created by the organization adopting the standard therefore if you adopt the standard you will create your own methodology under that standard in accordance with that standard i have personal experience of doing two projects on the pm PMBOK framework and Prince2 methodology. I used the Prince2 methodology under PMI framework and it went very well. I did a project for Ministry of Defense, uh, Ministry of Justice USA and uh, you know they were very happy about it. Whereas uh, they do not generally recognize Prince2 as uh, something uh, really very great but you know uh, when I explained to them how I did it and why I did it uh, they were impressed about it that they can be married. There is no problem in it. Although Prince2 is a recognized certification worldwide, but this is more of use for the UK government because uh, it is mandatory uh, for every work you do with the government in UK or any any government working with UK would do it according to uh, these standards. Yeah, Prince2 and there are many other standards and they are very good standards also. Actually, UK government is uh, more um, authoritative. They enforce things down your throat. Um, but uh, UK government doesn't do that. US, uh, US government doesn't do that. They just uh, uh, no, uh, leave it to you uh, if you want to use whatever. So this is not mandatory in U uh, U USA that you use PMI or something else. That's why many of the organizations, in, in, in even USA, they it is not mandatory for them to use PMI. So this is the company policy, what standard they want to adopt. So, but still, with this uh, independence, uh, most of the organizations in North America are using PMBO independently without any force. So that is uh, again a good sign. So this is not to be applied uniformly on all the projects and who decides project management team is responsible for determining what is appropriate for any given project. So what is to be followed and what is not to be followed from the standard. And it is not the project manager who decides, it is his management team, project management team decides. So you will find subsequently in the standard that it is always the responsibility of the team, it is our teamwork. So there is no autocracy in project management. Project manager should not be the boss having a dunda in his hand and roaming around doing things. So he is actually working with his team and the, all the decisions are uh, mutually taken. Not like a democracy even, but you see, they have to be involved. Maybe the final decision is of the project manager, but team has to be involved and they have to take on the responsibility. The team is held responsible for all the decisions. Okay, after having um, talked about the purpose of the PMB, okay, let us see what a project is. Many definitions have surfaced since, you know, even before the PMI ever came into being. Uh, 
somebody said when well, this is a set of activities I am just talking about the old definition. Set of activities done in a coordinated manner and you know um, according to the budget and within the time constraints and this and that. Um, some very lengthy definitions, some very small definitions, some missing one point, some missing other point, some are like full paragraphs of a definition. They were all okay and some of the part, uh, some parts of all those definitions are good enough. But this definition, which is which came up, uh, which was very carefully and deliberately created by PMI, and created by PMI means PMI did not do it. I and you made it. So this is not only Americans doing this work. We also work on it. So from all over the world, there is equal partnership. More than 15,000 people work on us development of a standard. Some are working in a core team. Some are working from um, uh, you know uh, from afar and so on and so forth but this definition is so comprehensive whatever comes to your mind about project management about the definition of project management is encompassed encompassed in this small little definition so let us see what what does it say it says project is a temporary endeavor two words temporary and endeavor what does temporary mean Temporary means that this, whatever this is, this is going to finish someday. So that specifies that project must have a start and must have a finish. Someday it will start and someday it will finish. It is not going to be there forever. So temporary stands for that. And just after that it says endeavor. What is an endeavor? An effort. So we are trying to make an effort, but we are not sure that we will be successful. So we are getting into a challenging assignment, which we have never done before. And we are not definitely sure that we will be successful. So we are endeavoring to do something and naturally we will do our level best to accomplish the goal. But there is a probability that we may not achieve the target. So this is kind of a research work. It is kind of uh, um, an effort taken and that effort despite our best uh, best efforts could result in a failure so that is a given but at the same time I would say we should not count all our failures towards this uh, uncertainty although this indicates uncertainty because we have never done this kind of job before but uh, if this is your laxity, is your laziness due to which the project failed, then you can't blame it on uh, because it was uncertain endeavor and therefore, uh, therefore we failed. So I am saying despite your best efforts, still it can fail. So therefore it is an effort, this is an endeavor which has to be taken up in a temporary time duration. And naturally if the time is temporary, the money to be spent in this will also be encapsulated. So cost will also be to, limited to some amount. So within budget, within cost is covered here. Within scope is covered here. What is the scope of this much work? That scope would be defined within this space. So scope, time, cost, everything is covered into this one, two words, temporary endeavor. And then why are we doing it? We are doing it as we have already mentioned that we are dealing with some kind of a challenge and some kind of uncertainty. So we are trying to create something new, which we are trying to do something which has never been done before. That is, that's why it is a project. If we have done it before, then this is not a project. This is, this probably should be the operations. If I, I do it repeatedly, I do it as a habit. I do it as an operation then it is not a project at all. Why should we be calling it a project? So we are creating something new. And what that something is, that deliverable is, is ultimately going to come out as a unique product, a unique service or a unique result. Whatever we are going to be, what we are expecting from this project, again, because it has never been done before. So this thing, this output is unique. So Although you may have some differences so far, but this is pretty much encompasses the whole definition of the project management.
and rest everything is the explanation. We have considered time, cost, scope, and these are the basic things. The three basic objectives of a project are the scope, time, and cost. So if you can encapsulate it, you can also mention that it's a temporary endeavor. You also know that the deliverable is going to be something new and it is a creation of some, some product or deliverable we are talking about. So this is what the definition of the project is. So you agree with it, Shahan? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, only one thing I wanted to uh, answer. Uh, if a project has a definite start and a definite end, which is a temporary endeavor, so uh, implies uh, the same. And uh, it is non repetitive. It is non repetitive. I said it is not. Uh, it is not iterative. That means it is non repetitive. Correct, sir. Yeah. And second thing, one more thing you must uh, uh, understand. When we say this a temporary endeavor, people say, okay, project has a definite start and a definite finish end, finish date. That is not what I'm saying. I'm saying project will start sometime at some time and will, will finish at some time. So it has a limited span of life. I'm not saying that it must start on 1st January and must finish on 31st of December. Once you impose such kind of limitations, they are called constraints. What if you have put on the constraint of 1st January and 31st December and the project, uh, the actual work of the project cannot be done before two years? How can you compress this into one, week, one year? So th that does not say the constraints here. Constraints could be considered later. We can do a lot many things with the constraints. We can impose the constraints and there are there is some discipline to impose the constraint. If you want to uh, impose a constraint on the start date, you should never be imposing a constraint on the start finish date. If you are imposing a constraint on the finish date, you should not be imposing a constraint on the start date. Because then you are compression. If there is a problem and you have to do it, then we can, we, we can find ways of accelerating the project. And then, for example, I can accelerate this two-year project in one and a half year, then uh, still I am unable to do it in one year. So, so somebody has to accommodate here. I have done my level best. This was my level best. I can do it in one and a half year. Then you have to, you know, enlarge your, you know, limits to one and a half year or something like that. So this all is a later decision which will come, uh, uh, discuss when it comes in front of us how we apply the constraints and all. But if you have this idea that definite start and definite finish means a definite start date already known and a definite finish date already known, that is wrong. Then ever the project will finish, will start at some time. And if it has started, after having met its objective, it will finish at some date. Maybe the planned date was one year. Uh, within uh, the project had to be done in one year it was completed in two years still the project is completed still it is a temporary endeavor but why did it enlarge from one year to two years there must be a reason behind it there might be the scope of the project was doubled and therefore the project time was doubled so this is a genuine reason which could have been accommodated through a proper change request and the project duration was formally increased to two years so project is okay. There is no problem with the project. This is a, this is uh, it. Still started on a on on a specific date and ended on a date. So the temporary endeavor form, definition is okay with it. So this is the temporary nature of the project. Um, indicates a definite beginning and definite end and is reached when the project objectives can be achieved. Yes, this is important. Uh, when the project objectives are met, all the project objectives are met, the purpose for which the project was started, the project must finish. The project is terminated because its objectives will not or cannot be met. You know, why did you start the project? Naturally, for some benefit to the organization. When you started the project, at that point in time, you thought, that this is according to our current strategy, this project should be done and this deliverable should come out of it. But down the road, it is none of the faults of the project, down the road your strategy has changed. 
and the need for project has also changed. You no more need that deliverable or that project, so you can terminate the project. So if there there is no more the need for that project, the uh, uh, I mean uh, uh, the objectives uh, uh, project is not going to be meeting those objectives. Or you feel it cannot meet that objective, uh, uh, the project can be terminated. Like you see, one phase of the project uh, has uh, you know you are you are doing the project in phases. After one phase, you realize that this is an impossible target. We are spending an inordinate amount of money into the project and this is not going to yield the results and it is apparent that ultimately when we finish the project it will it will be not, not be of much use to us. So you can decide at that point at the end of one phase or two phase or three phase that project is no more to be run any further. Similarly if the strategy has changed that is the third point the need for the project no longer exists even then you can close the project. So there were three conditions objectives are met number two uh, the project is terminated due to uh, objectives cannot be met. Third is the project strategy, the organizational strategy has changed and project is no more required. So these are the three conditions when the project can be closed uh, officially. A deliverable, when I just say the word deliverable, that means I am referring to the product service or result. It could have used the word uh, deliverable only but uh, product could be a deliverable product could be a tangible good with specific specifications and requirements but some it is not always that we are making boxes sometimes we are providing some service maybe if uh, 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 providing you this service is a project so at the end of the day I have not given you anything but knowledge so that knowledge, if delivered properly and you have absorbed it, then the deliverable has been delivered. So this could be in form of a service or it could be in form of a result. You say, maybe you ask me to create a feasibility study for a specific business case. And I submitted a 200 page long feasibility study at the end of the day and that serves the purpose of the feasibility. Anyone else could say, just 200 pages are costing you this much money. You know, how is it possible? So, even uh, the result is a document. That is a deliverable. That is also a deliverable. So, product could be, uh, I mean, the deliverable could be a product, a physical product, or a service, or even a result. If you have produced that result, you have uh, accomplished the goal of the project. Uh, moreover, um, naturally, I am saying, all these things, three things as deliverable and I am saying that they could be product, they could be service, they could be result. But normally in market, the word which is used here, uh, used in place of deliverable is generally, people call it product. They don't care it is service or result, but they just call it product. So generally speaking, when somebody says product, you must clarify, is he only talking about the product or he is referring to the product, service or result. So people usually say product. So product for, from their perspective means all of this. I take great care in that, that I do not call it product. I call it the deliverable. So And deliverable I know could be either product or service or result. So this, these are the three, three expected outputs of a project. Uh, any one of these three things. Examples of the projects could be developing something, you know, we, whatever we are doing, we are doing something new. We are uh, developing a new product or service for the first time. You know, maybe you, your company decides to launch a new product. But they have their own operations running. And the older products are being manufactured and you know, whatever you are doing, you are doing your business. The operations are running. But you, your, your strategy is that if we can introduce this new product, this will increase our business value or whatever. So they will start it as a project because they are not sure if this product can really be made or not. So once the project, project is successful and we are sure through this experiment that yes, the, the thing can be, uh, the product or service can be delivered and this is the procedure how to do it then 
this whole thing, the product as well as the whole procedure is adopted by the operations. New SOPs are formed for using them and adopting them into operations and that product will come into manufacture. That will be part of the operations. Project will finish after having uh, uh, produced this result. And it might be possible the project could not produce this result and project failed and ultimately closed down. In that case, it will not be adopted in the operation. Maybe a new feasibility is carried out and a new concept or idea is launched from there on. Then affecting a change in the structure, staffing or style of an organization. You might have problems in your organization. You might have, you know, you uh, may need to uh, revise your TNA, training need assessment system. So that thing could be uh, addressed through a project. You might uh, need to enhance the productivity of your people or maybe quality of your system. So whatever the assignment is, it is a change in the organizational structure or the system of the organization or the SOPs are to be changed or procedures are to be changed. Then this every time there is a change, we have to resolve to some kind of project to bring that change about. And once that change is proven right, that yes, it can be done and they have done it, they've shown how to do it, then it is adopted by the operations. Disha Khan, I'm sorry, I have Yes, sir. My question is on the previous slide, sir. Um, see, if there are two types of uh, uh, projects which we usually engineers do is something tangible and people can see the, the result of uh, the deliverable as you said mm -hmm. after the project has been executed. But right. in, in terms of these development projects sir, which people do and, uh, and, and spend a lot of money and after that the, the outcome is not known in, like, like on education uh, quality uh, in, in, uh, we, w we want to enhance the quality of education in Pakistan oh, yeah. and for that today some NGO funded a huge project and all the money is gone. So yeah. at the end of the you know project how to mirror uh, the, the deliverables of such a project. Sir. Oh. So I think in Pakistan this is one of the issues. So this uh, from the beginning I, I, I don't understand. For us uh, it is it's tangible something you can see or you can you will directly see the result of after the project. Okay, so uh, that's, that's my question, sir. Right. You see, what you are talking about is much beyond the scope of project. You are talking about something which will deliver a benefit for the organization. Here we are only talking about the product, service, or result. Projects have a limited scope. Projects only concern themselves with the product, service, or result are deliverable. What you are talking about is the mandate of a program to improve the education system of the country, to improve the infrastructure of the country. So these are not projects. People call them projects wrongly. But CPEC is a project. Who, who is so stupid to call CPEC a project? CPEC is not a project. CPEC is not even a program. <laughs> that is a portfolio of projects and programs. And nobody uh, realized that so far. And you know they call it this CPEC project, CPEC project. What is, what is this nonsense going on? <laughs> so, if government decides to improve the education standard, they have to be very specific. What is the current education standard and what do they want? As is and to be status. What is the current and what is the future expected future state? Now, changing from this state to that state will deliver certain benefits. Those benefits must, must be outlined by the respective ministry. And then this job, not the deliverable, they are not telling you to construct a school or make a university. They are just telling you to enhance or improve the education in this region from this point to this point. Right now, the program manager who is responsible for this assignment is going to have his own program strategy. He will strategize. How can he do that? And then he will plan that I will do that in a number of projects. There will be project uh, a project for construction of 20 schools. Then there will be five universities constructed. Then there will be awareness campaigns going on, marketing going on, and all this. This all will be the budget of the program. This all, all these projects will be included in the pro program. And 
all these program, projects would be contributing some benefit to the program objectives. The program, rather, I would say programs have benefits. Projects have deliverables. Programs do not have deliverables. Nobody is going to ask you how many universities you made in this project. They will ask you, have you met your target or not? Now, like our government, um, whatever government is there, they say we have done this, we have done that. Who is asking you to enumerate how many centers you have made, how many hospitals you have made? We are asking you, have the health issue resolved? Have you met your targets? Is the education according to whatever you expected it to be? If it is not, then who cares how many hospitals and how many schools you have made? Because schools are made only for ghosts. <laughs> you see, we get a lot of funding. We are a beggar nation for that matter. We, if we get donations. You know, United Nations once uh, gave money for construction of 500 schools. And this is the normal happening. You know, this thing keeps happening in health, in education, in whatever. They keep giving you donations and uh, uh, they, uh, they um, give you money, they get the things on uh, and then they go away. And we don't run the show. So those 500 schools were constructed, were existing on the ground. But once the funding ceased and the project finished, they, they had gone back. Government of Pakistan, the Ministry of Education, did not take the responsibility of populating those schools with teachers, students, books, everything. Nobody was posted there. No people were hiring. They, they were least interested in it. So what is this nonsense that we are, at, when it is, it is time to get the donation, we are so uh, big a beggar nation that we will always be opening our mouth to that, give everything to us. But when it is the time to make use of that effectively, we are least bothered. Why? Because we are just interested in that money, how much can we eat out of it? The benefit which has to pass on to the public, we are least bothered about it. Same is true for the politician, same is true for the bureaucrat. Who bothers? Who cares? Have you asked anybody who is in position? How much is he concerned about the state of education in the country? There are a lot many people sitting in education ministry and they are just doing their job. And uh, 9 to 5, whatever, they, they do their job and they are least bothered if education has anything to do with Pakistani people. No benefit, no benefit whatsoever is being transferred to the people of Pakistan. Moreover, uh, if at all, some benefit is being delivered that is delivered either by volunteers or by private institutes. But private institutes, you understand, they have got other designs. They want to earn money. They, they, have just, they are doing this as a business. So if in the way some people get educated, some people are better off, that is okay, but they are making money out of it. But the health, education, all this, whatever, these developmental projects, this is the job of the government. So they must create their own portfolio. They must have proper program. And this PC12345 business is all trash. The only thing I know is PC1, which happens. And that too happens in a very absurd way. You know, uh, uh, look at the PC1 of uh, um, the orange train and metro and this and that. They were created in one night. Feasibilities were created in one night. What nonsense are you talking about? If uh, a government department wants to start a genuine project, their PC1 will never pass for next one, two, three years. PC1s never get through. And uh, uh, the, the, the blue-eyed projects, they because somebody else is benefiting out, out of it, and you know the top level people are involved in it, so they will just you know get a group like this, and the money is distributed. And then it goes to hell. You know, tell me uh, what will happen to Metro after this government. Will the next government support it? Will the next government maintain it? I don't know uh, if it is still yielding the desired benefit or not. Um, is, the, is it cost effective or not? But anyways, people say, well, because it is made, it is good. 
good for people well that is not uh, a valid very valid argument that because it has been made so it, we must use it is it sustainable moreover uh, is it cost effective right now if you have taken all the loans from all of wide world and you just did this one project for your own show running your own election campaign and all that we we made the metro for you we made for this for you these are no contribution tell us what strategic goals have you achieved how much the education has improved how much the health has improved how much the welfare of the people has been done not through the projects but through the programs the benefits must speak out of it and normally the, these benefits are depicted in your financial reports and your budget and those budgets are fudged as usual so uh, that is my answer to it that uh, these things are programs which where we talk about the large benefits thank you sir i understood okay so other types of projects could be like i said affecting a change in the structure staffing and style of an organization developing or acquiring a new or modified information system there is a craze of automating though those organizing are completely manual there is a craze of automating so you are acquiring a new system new information system or whatever that is something new happening to your organization that is going to be a change in your organization the system will change accordingly therefore that is a project constructing a new structure infrastructure building bridge road whatever this is a project uh, implementing a new business process or procedure you want to enhance or improve your system we normally call it bpr business process reengineering and i have worked on some project like that and really it is pathetic because we were doing one of the organizations which is very i assumed it to be very professional and very good national highway authority they were again this was a donation from you united nation organization and they wanted to in get the system improved so they gave money for business process engineering only then they agreed to get take money they had no need for improving the process they were living but whatever life they were living that everything is fine for them so when they uh, uh, united nation people came and they said that you need that yes yes we need that okay definitely i agree they need that uh, they hired me as a consultant in that and i uh, worked with them uh, with the consultant organization <clears throat> and when we went to uh, uh, them for business process reengineering um, we were told we had to study the existing system and then we had to design that to be system and then we have to uh, uh, bring the changes and start the project so we wanted to study the existing system and we when we went to their people in authority they said uh, you are not allowed to see our system you are not allowed to see our system from where then from heaven should i bring a new system and impose upon you just because the money has, money is there and your offices will be refurbished and everything will be it's not like that you have to tell me how you work they said okay we have got uh, uh, the books of regulations and all that and we work according to that you take those books away don't come to our office and you do your study there so we uh, took out a place outside of an ha in a building and we sat down there i had a staff and they also and the interesting part they also imposed on the cons consultant organization to hire a brigadier as the project director so this guy was put on top of me and uh, we were doing all that job and you know he was the project director of this project but he was nha jasus he was a person from nha or you know thing like that but he was paid from this very interesting and like traditional fogies he used to uh, call me daily why are you late you know, what do you mean what are why are you late i am not here on a you know 10 9 to 5 job i am a consultant i i will work when i will work i work whole night i come and bring results to you so what should i do in front of you he said no, you come down sit down we get to have tea and i said i am done with the days when i used to have tea breaks and all that gap shop i work now 
so uh, there is no fun talking to you i don't enjoy talking to you because you do not have anything to talk about common sense koi nahi hai so he was quite offended but i i made it a point that i will not budge to that anyways i kept doing that job and we our team developed the complete thing um, uh, out of the books only we were not allowed to see the system once we were done with that and before we could proceed ahead we went went to nha again and we asked them uh, well we have made something but we have to confirm it whether you do exactly what uh, book says and is, is it in conformance or not so please allow me to you know interview these people and you know get this confirmation um, they you know half heartedly they allowed that uh, and we were only allowed to talk to certain people only right so directors and all that and um, uh, we you, we went to them and we found that the uh, none of the practices which are in book were being followed and they were doing whatever they wanted to do every department was doing whatever they wanted to do some were doing good work some were doing bad work but none of them were following any standards or any book any uh, any operating procedure no not at all um and i had an interview with the hr guy uh, hr whatever they call it director or dg or whatever and uh, that was uh, that person was so arrogant uh, i naturally i asked time from everyone uh, beforehand took an appointment went to their offices and met this one person was so arrogant he uh, gave me the time when i reached there he was not there he came one hour late we were sitting in his office inside his office when he came into to his office and he uh, he minded it that we are sitting in his office i told him we had an appointment with you he said you asked for the appointment i didn't ask for the appointment so i'll not meet you i said okay if i don't talk to you now i will never talk to you again i'll never interview you again and mujhe jo zyada bura laga wo ye tha ki he was retired air force guy uh, i didn't like it what nonsense are you talking about yeah exactly but he is not ready to talk and whole nha was afraid of this guy uske office ke samne se bhi nahi guzar this is how the hr runs this is autocracy they are running out there is ki report saaf kar do usko yeh kar do usko nikal do what nonsense are you doing you are not thane dar there you are to facilitate the human resource you have to you know do things about that he was not doing everything but anyways on the lighter side later on uh, i found out that he was my neighbor he hired this this house next to me and when he learned that he specially came to meet me naturally he was a quite senior guy but he apologized and all that. i said i don't want to meet you at all thank you very much so uh, uh, that is one of the reasons i think and i know i i believe that people from armed forces uh, may be good at personnel management from army point of view but they are not hr managers they should not think themselves as hr managers they don't know any iota about hr management they don't know how to do all those things that's their forgotten everything that they should know exactly exactly so they have you know danda in their hand and they think that probably they are the commanding officers there and they can do everything uh, but i have seen people uh, who are excellent hr managers and these are normally those who are coming out of business schools and uh, especially those who are really from their hearts they they are involved in, in the job uh, there was one of the persons in uh, uh, previously in lmkr and then later in elixir and he was not uh, you know a business guy he was not educated to be a hr manager but he was so fantastic whenever i used to go to him his calendar was full for what nobody was visiting him he was visiting everybody he will go to this department that department he will have appointments with different managers and talk to them about their career how they can improve and enhance 
and then he will go, go back to the office run some statistics and then design a training program training need assessment sometimes he used to call me i conducted some trainings for them and you know he was continuously in an effort improving and enhancing the skills of his people and uh, as I, I was giving the example of this thing um, nha people do not did not like to go near the office of the hr manager and this person everybody just wanted to walk into his office sir how are you kya ho raha because he was so cordial with everybody and he was not harming anyone he was rather in, encouraging them and supporting them in their career growth so that was the environment which probably uh, hr manager should have and uh, homework bhi to karna padta hai statistical work saab kitab kuch the things should be done apna analysis to karna koi nahi hai so we do, do like that to uske bagair hum chahte hain ki sab kuch ho jaye right ji anyways then the next is the uh, what is a project management you see these are simple definition but uh, there is a lot in it so okay now this is also interesting what is project management naturally it is the management of the project fine but what exactly is involved in project management okay probably we discussed that project will deliver something some deliverable and what is to be delivered is decided by uh, already because whomsoever is the customer they have provided as the requirement that i need this thing so that thing is to be produced to the to the project so here in project we are concerned about all the work which is required to be done to produce that deliverable to fulfill those requirements so the first point is only that work should be done which is contributing to the fulfillment of the requirements anything which is beyond beyond the requirement any work which is delivering something more than the requirement or which is del delivering something irrelevant to the requirement that all is out of scope and all the work which must be done to deliver the requirements must be included nothing out of that could be excluded from the project so this is very strict the only in scope items has to be done so all the work that had to be done this is called the project activities to meet the project requirements on those project activities project management is application of knowledge skills tools and techniques but only on that knowledge you can't apply project management knowledge skills tools and techniques on operations or on finance so this is to be applied only on those activities which are contributing towards the project deliverables or project meeting the project requirements and we are very strict about it that nothing should be done out of scope and anything which is in scope must not be missed out so all the work and only the work is a very good definition of the scope you must do all the work within the scope of the project and you must not do anything beyond the scope of the project which is out of scope so now read this definition again knowledge uh, application of knowledge skills tools and techniques to the project activities to meet the project requirement although if you read it uh, uh, yourself probably you won't be able to you know uh, take this meaning out of it there is more to it let us see what is the knowledge what is the skills what is the tool what is the technique he is talking about ne definitely he is talking about something relevant to the project management so the very first thing you need to do a project is the knowledge of project management do you have a knowledge of project management everybody claims to have been doing projects for years on end but have you got the knowledge of project management you may have the technical knowledge you may be an engineer you may be a doctor and you may know your job very well that's all right but at the same time do you have any education or training in project manager management which are using there this is a very broad question and i tell you most of the project managers do not have any education 
in project management. I was an engineer, I was studying in the university and uh, trust me, we were never taught project management. The only time I understand something uh, close to project management is done was an optional subject by the name of engineering economics. In that, in that, there was a passing reference about pearl chart, critical path, passing reference. Nobody even, you know, that was all covered in almost five to ten minutes in a lecture. No importance to it. As such, project management was never taught to us. Number one. All what we, and immediately after becoming engineers, we went to the field and started working on the project and whatever experience good or bad good or bad i'm saying that because you know some of us had good opportunities some had good teachers some had not did not have so whatever we learned from that we thought this is only the right that this is my experience i have 15 years of experience and i know the right thing you know probably i, I told you my own commanding officer uh, after his retirement uh, he said well I must do BMP and he is a gold medalist. He is an intelligent person. He has a photographic memory. He failed thrice in BMP exam. Why? I, I discussed him with him um, at length. What is the problem? Why do you fail? You remember everything. He knew the references to the pages of BMP. Okay. This thing is given on this page and this paragraph. And this sentence is written there. And then what's wrong with you in the exam? So what he does is, because it is a scenario-based question, as soon as the question comes, you decide on your own opinion, own expertise, own experience. And you say, okay, I will do this. You don't see what PMBOK says, what knowledge says. You don't refer to knowledge. You refer to your personal expertise, which might be wrong. Your expertise is groomed in a wrong way. Like, you know, a lot many things, like, you know, uh, the, all the ethical questions we attempt wrong. Because uh, ethics ka to bede gar ka So, wo cheeze hum, we are not doing them right. So, pehli baat ye, or, uh, about 5-10 years back, I had an opportunity of, uh, you know, delivering a lecture in UET, uh, their final year students. Um, and I was called as a guest speaker on project management. And I said, well, I'm going to engineering university and well, many years have passed and things would have changed. And naturally, <clears throat> when I stood up there, I, I, I prepared for the advanced project management topics. So I asked them, uh, you are in what, what's Mr. I'm in finance minister. So you must have studied project management and uh, I should be talking more about the advanced topics. They said, what is project management? You don't study project management? Not yet. Still, they don't study project management as a subject in engineering. And engineers are the claimants, biggest claimants, being the project managers. So, the very first fundamental thing, knowledge is missing. Don't treat this knowledge as a technical knowledge of civil engineering or construction or whatever. That knowledge is, is good at its own place, but you must have project management knowledge as well. And this standard is the beautiful thing which will bridge that gap. The only thing you need to be a bit flexible because your hard-earned expertise is, is making you resistant to change, resistant to adopt this knowledge. So if you can be flexible enough to adopt this knowledge, it will help you a lot. All your previous experience would be justified there you would yourself be able to analyze backwards and see whatever you had been doing wrong and you will never do it wrong again. So that must be the sense. Only then you can improve that. So that was the knowledge. Second part is the skill. Skill kiss is called that. What is experience? Experience should be built on knowledge. You did not have knowledge and you have a lot of skill. You have 15, 20, 30 years of experience. Based on what? Based on no knowledge. Oh, no. Right. That means uh, it is multiplied by zero. Now you attain the knowledge and now you start applying. Your experience starts from here. I, I don't want to be that harsh. 
let us validate your previous experience by being flexible and making amendments to your past experiences, amending your experience and then claiming all of that experience as your skill. I am okay with that. But again, you have to be flexible around, around it. Okay, you have, you have knowledge, project management knowledge, you have skills, but you do not have the tools and techniques. Okay, what are the tools and techniques? Give, let me give you an example, more appropriate, uh, where some tangible tools and techniques are there. Let's take an example of a carpenter. He has been trained for six months in, a, you know, whatever kind of school trains the carpenters and he acquired the knowledge. What was he taught there? What kind of wood, there, wood is there? How the wood is cut? How wood is transported? How it is seasoned? You know, how it is prepared? How furniture is made? How you can saw? How, you know, all those things he has been taught. So this is all the knowledge. Now, when he gets out of the school, he cannot be employed uh, just because he doesn't have much of experience. So anybody, any carpenter would be having a 10 or 15 years of experience. I will be confident to hire that guy. So skill takes importance. But na naturally, if there is knowledge, then a little experience would, would bridge the gap. Another person who did not have any knowledge, he learned through the hard way in 15 years, he might be equivalent to a knowledgeable carpenter with three years of experience. They, they will be exactly equal. It is just like, you know, in engineering, they teach you everything, but you don't expect, experience everything in your practical life. In, in civil engineering, we were taught uh, even uh, the railways and water, uh, hydraulics and all that. But I don't know, I have ever uh, used the knowledge of railways and hydraulics and this and that. Maybe some of my postmates who probably went into the canal business or something, they might be using it. Someone who is an engineer with the railways, he might be uh, using that knowledge, but we did not. So you only use that knowledge which you come across. So uh, now if, if you have knowledge and little experience in the relevant area, you will pick those items from your knowledge and you will build your expertise. One of my friends, he remained in design uh, of engineering. He may not be a very good implementer, but he has exclusive experience in design. Wonderful experience in design. Some of uh, my colleagues have been uh, uh, in construction business throughout. So uh, they are authority on that subject, but they know nothing about many other things. It is just like an eye specialist or an ENT specialist. So he is only good in his area, although he is also a MBBS. But he is only good in his area because he has not practiced the other areas for quite so, so long and that knowledge is kind of rusty. Right. So this is... Now, the, uh, 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 the, there is a carpenter with relevant knowledge and uh, skills and I ask him to make this table for me. He says, sir, I can't do that. Why? He has knowledge, he has skills. Why can't he do that? Kya he does not have the tools, sir. Saw and hammers and all these. He doesn't have the tools. Open up. Toolbox on a bullya. So without the tools, uh, his experience and knowledge cannot be that even. He can't do it with his own hands. So he needs his tools. So, but as a project manager, you must recognize what are your tools. As a foggy, what are your tools? The weapon is your tool. As a, as a, um, uh, you know, uh, project manager, you must have some tools. This book will teach you what are those tools. But you must have your tools available. And, okay, but I tell this carpenter is, okay, you didn't bring your tools. I have got a toolbox lying in my workshop. I'll give you that. Please make a table for me. So what is the response of the carpenter? Exactly, exactly. The technique, this is the technique. Although it is the same kind of equipment. I have the saw, I have the hammer, I have nail, I have everything. But uh, the saw he is used to using is, you know, adjusted to his hand. 
you know the sa has got small little you know indentations which actually are used for cutting it at just if you buy a new one it is very difficult to cut but after some time it adjusts to, to your hand so the sa he is giving me is adjusted to someone else's hand i cut like this and and my, all the indentations in my sa are curved to that that angle whereas this sa is you know i have to get used to it it's just like uh, you take my car for for some use you will have to have some problem initially in braking and accelerating and doing that because you don't know the play in my car because you are uh, you are adjusted with your car i can uh, i have no problem in driving my car but someone else will definitely will take some time to adjust to that so that is the technique so i need to have all these four things to apply on the project activities as if uh, i can deliver the project so this is the definition of project management although it's just one sentence but this is very deep meaning this is really very important okay from pmb okay point of view uh, this project management thing is accomplished through the appropriate application and integration of 47 logically grouped project management processes comprising in five process groups now we are coming to the specifics of pmbo there are 47 processes in pmbo okay and they are grouped in five groups and they are unevenly grouped one group may have only two one group may have 24 but they are grouped into these five process groups and there are total of 47 processes and through these 47 processes we want to do effective project management so the good practices are encapsulated in these 47 processes that's what pmbok stands for it has given you a framework divided it into uh, 47 processes grouped in five process groups and this is what we will be following on from third chapter onwards so this was uh, what the project management is and these are the five process groups can you see that slide initiating planning execution monitoring and controlling and closing initiating process group planning process group executing process group monitoring and control controlling process group and closing process group okay uh, i will just explain broadly what is done in each one of these process groups naturally there are number of processes in each process groups and i'll just briefly define what each process group does but whatever i will be defining please do not take that as the processes i am just defining what is done that could be in bullets but those bullets are not the processes i am generally going to talk about what is to be done in initiation what is to be done in planning and so on and so forth so let's first talk about initiation okay probably this was a question in the uh, in the paper you took also in initiation it is the responsibility of the project sponsor as well as project manager to see the alignment of project with the organizational objectives this is must a project sponsor has look at it from his angle project manager has look at it from his angle project manager why would he do that because he had to write a charter and a an order and an authorization for the project manager to take this job before he does that he has to see whether the job he is trying to give to the project manager is it still feasible so he may run a small little check a small little you know feasibility check and if he is satisfied that whatever the previous feasibility was done is still valid and this project should be continued and it should be started so he will give the charter to the project manager that is an authorization order for the project manager to start the work now the project manager uh, uh, is new 
when he receives this order, first thing he needs to see, what is this? This is a job given to me. For what? For this organization. But what is, you see, I am telling you the logical sequence of questions. Okay, for this organization, whatever we are doing is for the organization. We can't be doing something outside of the organization. So my orientation has to be within the organization. So it should benefit my organization. So what is the direction of my organization? Do I know as a project manager? Don't just start looking at the project. First define what is the direction of my organization? What is the vision of my organization? What is the overall objective scope goals of my organization? Then look at the project and see, is it, say, is it fitting somewhere? under those goals and objectives. If it does not, then there is a problem. Project manager must blow the whistle at this point that there is a problem. This project is not aligned with the organization strategy. Maybe he skipped the sponsor. Sponsors had done only a broad level of, uh, you know, validation of the feasibility and he might have skipped something. So he would be more than pleased to know that there is a problem and he may get it fixed going backwards. But project manager's very first responsibility is to see the alignment of the project with the organization objectives and confirm it. And also, he also has to see this alignment with the customer needs for whom you are doing this project. Your customer could be internal to the organization or external to the organization. It could be another department within my own organization. So, I have to see what he requires from me. What are his requirements? Are, is the project aligned according to his needs or not? Maybe project is aligned with the customer needs, but in is not in alignment with the project object, uh, organizational objective. Or other way around. Both ways, uh, there is a problem. So both of these things to, should be satisfied. Organizational objectives should be met and customer needs should also be met. If the customer is internal, then there is, mostly there will be no problem. But if the customer is external, he has nothing to do with your organizational objectives. So he would have his own demands. So if fulfilling his demands is, uh, I have to do certain things not in alignment with my organizational objective, that is bad. I have to balance both. I have to balance both. And if any one of these factors are not meeting, we have to correct it. Then, Although developing the scope statement is not the job, job of initiation, but developing a basic idea from the charter and other documentation provided to me as a project manager, I have to be clear about two things. Number one, uh, what is the overall scope of the project? A high level scope, not the detailed scope we are talking here. So I must understand that scope. If I am not clear about the scope, I must ask the sponsor. Secondly, the, does this scope include the stakeholder needs and expectations? Now here arises another question. Who are the stakeholders? It is not only the customer. These are all the people, all the organizations or all the individuals who have anything to do with the project. Uh, whether they can affect the project or they can be affected by the result of the project. <clears throat> All of these people are stakeholders, no matter if they are affected positively or negatively. They are positive stakeholders, they are negative stakeholders. No matter they are big or small, they are big stakeholders, small stakeholders. Every stakeholder has to be properly identified, their needs and expectations noted. That is the fourth point, stakeholder identified and their needs understood. And here we are saying the scope statement is according to the scope we have understood is is it according to the st uh, stakeholder needs and expectations and then we also have to see if if optionally there is some constraint provided or limitation or assumption or there are any high level risks identified to us at this stage because at this stage it can be very broad broadly this is the risk broadly uh, this could be a constraint. So when I will dig down while planning, I will go into further detail and I'll elaborate in detail about the risks, assumptions, constraints uh, and everything.
and lastly the project charter must, must be properly approved by the requisite authority who is the requisite authority the author of the project charter is the project sponsor normally people think it is the project manager project manager is not the author he is the receiver of the order so he might be asked to help project sponsor to prepare this document but basically he is preparing a order for himself so he doesn't have the authorship rights on that document the author the author and the signatory of that is the sponsor in some cases uh, sponsor uh, is answerable to a project board before he can give the charter to the project manager he may take the charter to the project board and get it approved or signed by all the project members or the head of the project board whomsoever it generally project sponsor is the head of project uh, board so it is all right to say that project sponsor signs it but if at all somebody specifically asks you in a quiz that who signs the project charter and senior management or project board is an option then take that otherwise it is sponsor right if it is mentioned there is a senior uh, senior management approves the charter yes it does so this is all about initiation ji shahan clear sir okay i just wanted to have a question but uh, in through the lecture it was clear sir okay okay um uh, I'll quickly i'll just go through these because naturally these thing will come later in planning uh, there are 10 knowledge areas there are five process groups there are 10 knowledge area each one of the knowledge area has to be deliberately planned in detail so there has to be a management plan for every knowledge area the scope project scope has to be developed and agreed schedule has to be developed and approved cost has to be estimated and budgeted project team has to be identified the roles assigned and everything communication activities quality risk and integration of these all these things all the 10 knowledge areas are not mentioned here but practically speaking all the 10 knowledge areas get together to form the overall project management plan and once the project management plan is final you have uh, finally gotten it approved from the sponsor that is the time you get into the execution of the project and in execution you just have to follow the plan just like in operations we follow the sop we follow the sop standard operating procedures similarly in execution you just have to follow what is written in the project document you cannot do anything on your own without the permission or the change request so if we'll do that we'll have problems and that is exactly probably i was mentioning you yesterday about army housing society yes they had problem of their sewerage and piping and all that so there is no change at all there is no as is to be done just because there is no change request so in execution nobody is allowed to do anything beyond or less than the project management plan so when you will execute the project management plan the scope will be achieved stakeholder expectations will be met human resource will be managed quality will be managed and material resources will be used and job will be done and in case there is a difficulty there is a problem immediately change move a change request to monitoring and control just be rest assured that monitoring and control is happening while execution is happening so it is not that monitoring and control will happen after the execution monitoring and control team is sitting in the ops room or in a you know project management office or whatever you want to call it and they are ready to take your calls so change request must be sent immediately and they will do the needful amend the plan and let you know change request must be always mm -hmm. and do you do 
Actually, we do all the planning, uh, further planning work in execution. Well, you can say it goes back to planning area. So that is the hoping that you can, yeah, yeah. And if the plan then changes and then goes back to the executing process. Exactly. The, the cycle will continue. But generally speaking, I will define it. Say, this is the room where my planning team was working. Once the plan has been done and finished, now the planning team has vacated this room and monitoring and control team has come and sit, sit down there. No, execution is in the field. Execution is in the field. Now this room is populated maybe by the same people, but this is now the monitoring and control team. Exactly. Exactly. They will keep an eye on the execution and they will deal with the change request and they will do the replanning and everything. So it is done in this room. So for theoretical purposes, it's okay. The, it goes back to planning again execution. But practically speaking, monitoring and uh, control, uh, monitoring and controlling uh, when a change request is approved sends the approved change request back to execution along with the amended plans. So uh, as execution could know that these things are changed and now they can work accordingly. In monitoring and control, sorry, in monitoring and control, uh, as I said, it is keeping an eye on the project. It is tracking the project. Now, how can it keep an eye? Should it interfere into the business of project? No. They must have predetermined mechanism. Like project execution must be told that whenever any major item happens, you must inform us. So rather than I going into and bothering them in their work, I ask them to provide me report on each and every moment. Like there is a work authorization system, which is normally an organization system. When something has started, it must be reported to monitoring and control. When something has finished, it must be reported to monitoring and control. When something goes wrong, it must be reported. So that way, <coughs> monitoring and control will, control will have always all the current work performance data, which it can analyze. It already has the plan and compare it with the plan and see how much are we differing and put it right, keep the project on track, communicate with the stakeholders, inform them about the progress, take their feedback, so and manage all the changes. Quality is controlled here, risk is monitored and controlled here, project team uh, practically it is not managed here, it is managed in execution. And contracts are administrated, are controlled here. I'll explain that later in human resource, but project team uh, is practically monitored, uh, uh, managed in execution. Yeah. Because people come and go. So whatever uh, job you are taking out of them is the supervisor or the team lead. He is responsible for people. He will write their reports. He will do everything about the people. But based on the work performance report, which will come from monitoring and control. So from that pretext, it has written project team is managed. And lastly, when everything is done, according to the specifications, the project outcomes are accepted. Project resources are released. Stakeholder perceptions are noted, measured and analyzed for future project lessons learned. <clears throat> and project is formally declared closed. So this is the general picture which goes through these five process groups. But we will deliberate them in a lot of detail. We will dig down in each and every process, 47 processes. We will dig down each and every tool and technique of every process. There are more, more than 600 some tools and techniques in there. So you don't have to remember them. You have to understand them. So we will we'll talk about all that. These are the 10 knowledge areas. Integration is the father of them all. Integration makes the project management plan. And all remaining knowledge areas are, are subservient to it. They submit their plans to integration, which integrates it and converts it into a project plan. So we have got scope, your time, cost, quality, human resource, communication, risk, procurement, etc. So these are 
the 10 knowledge areas. I think I should close down here and we can continue tomorrow from this slide. Uh, any any point, Shahan? Uh, no, sir. It was clear and it was uh, nice uh, beginning in going into the uh, deeper, uh, you know, uh, techniques, tools and techniques, and all, which I'm really looking forward sir, to, to recall and again to implement. Once we have we are done with three chapters, I'll give you another quiz. So uh, that quiz will cover the first three chapters. So, but these three chapters are going to go for a long time. This, uh, we are going to be addressing these three chapters very coolly, very slow and steady, as if every concept is properly absorbed and understood. Um, we will decide uh, if uh, we need to have more time. I'll let you know a few days, one or two days more. Uh, I'll let you know. But generally speaking, we'll try to cover it within the prescribed time. Right, if uh, there is nothing else to say, I must close it down. Thank you very much for joining me and for listening to me so patiently. So take care and meet you tomorrow, same time. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Inshallah, sir. Okay, bye.